to see everybody, man. I've been black hawk down for a couple of days, so I am glad I, m- I missed you at Christmas Eve service. I got to watch online. It was a beautiful service, and I think Hunter did a great job with that service. He, Man, yeah, he filled in last minute, and he was ready to go. And so I, I was home and, and not doing too well that day and just kept praying and praying and believing and believing that the Lord would raise me up to be able to go to the tech game. <laughs> and uh, I had already purchased my tickets. No kidding, I'd already purchased my tickets. And I was like, Lord, I just need favor. And so I was able to, to go to that, and I was excited to see tech beat up on Mississippi State. That was a good day. Yeah, it was, I was so excited about that. And uh, I couldn't yell real loud because I was still kind of sick, but uh, I was still there. And then I got to go check off a bucket list. It might not be important to anybody else here. I've always wanted to go to Graceland. And so I got going down to Graceland. Anyway, so got to go to Graceland, and that was exciting for me, too, and, and got my picture made with Elvis, and he sang to me and everything. So uh, Elvis lives. That's all I'm going to say. Um, hey, man, we're, uh, we're, we're jumping into a new series this morning, and uh, I know that many of us, when we start off a new year, we do these things called New Year's resolutions, and, and you have goals that you want something to be different this year uh, from last year. And I hope that you do, but it's interesting to me that when we think about it, most of the times when we all make New Year's resolutions, um, most of them are more about, are self-centered in nature. They're more about me, and, and that's not entirely a bad thing. It's just an observation that I pick up, and in other words, some of you say, uh, this seems to be a big one every year. I'm going to lose weight this year. <laughs> January 1, I'm going on a diet. How many of you are already waiting on until Monday? Come on, somebody. Yeah, I, I feel you. I, I understand. I understand, man. And, and, and some of you say, man, I'm going to lose weight. Sometimes I'm going to eat better this year. And, or I, I want to keep my house cleaner this year. Or um, that might be some of your goals. And, and, and there might be. Uh, but they're more about us than they are anybody else. And so the tragedy, though, is, is when so much of our life, when it comes to God, is often more about us than it is about him. And that's just a fact. And so, for example, many people today, when it comes to God, they're trying to get God what they want him to do rather than trying to figure out what God wants to do with their life. And that seems to be a a hard issue for for many of us. And so sometimes it's a very self-centered thing. You know, God bless me. God help me be richer. Help me be happier. God give me what I want. And, And whenever life doesn't go as we want, there are some people that end up blaming God and they get mad at God. In other words, they might say, well, you know, I tried to go to church and and I tried to read my Bible and I did this and that and and I didn't get the better job and and I didn't get the better parking space at the mall, bless God. And and I wanted to date that girl and she ended up dating somebody else and, and I tried God and it didn't work because God didn't do what I wanted him to do. Is anybody here already? I, you know, here, you already made all the effort to get through the ice and the snow. You might as well enjoy it. Bless God. You already did the hard part. You can't get here now and talk about, you know, you can't get all Baptist on me right off the bat. Talking about, I shall not be moved, bless God. We are already here and online. I hope you're with me. But, but what's interesting is that when people think God exists for us, when in reality, we exist to honor and serve him. And so, in fact, when when Jesus invited people to follow him, this is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16. Whoever wants to be my disciple has to do this, is what he's going to say, must do this. And and listen, life's not going to be more about them, but this is what that person must do. They must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. If I want to be a disciple of Jesus, it's less about me and more about him. And and, and that's why as we move into a new year and the culture that we live in, a very self-centered, a very selfish culture, I want to talk for the next few weeks about things that are going to help us become more selfless and, and, and more obedient to following Christ. Because if I'm going to follow him, it's going to be less about me and more about him. So let me tell you what we're going to be talking about for the next few weeks so you can decide if you want to come or not. Okay? 
Today, I want to talk about, we've already hit on this a little bit, but I think this is an excellent part to hit on as we begin the new year, is God, make me stronger in my witness. Make me bold in my witness, bold in sharing our faith in Christ. And I also want to talk about being faithful in service and using our gifts to minister to other people. And we talk about being grateful in the grind. In other words, instead of God just do what I want, do what I want. God bless me. God make my life better. Instead, what if we said this? God used me to reach more people even if I'm laughed at and even if I'm ridiculed. Why don't you use me for your blessing? Come on, somebody. Make me bold in my witness. And, and so God used me in the gifts that I have to serve others, to show your love, even if that love makes me feel uncomfortable, make me faithful in your service. God, help me use what I have to be a blessing to others, even if I got to change the way I live. I'm already preaching better than your amen. And even if I got to change me, change me so I can bless somebody else and, and, and bless me that I can live or bless people and be extravagant in my generosity. And help me, God, every single day to wake up and do what may seem mundane, but to do it all for the glory and be grateful for the grind that you gave me. And I won't grab about what you've gave me. I'll be blessed and hold my head up high and say, thank you for another day. Come on, somebody. You got to get into this. Look here, if I'm preaching with this scratchy throat, you got to at least do your part. <laughs> Instead of being self-centered and being selfish, what if we as followers of Christ decided in 2022, we're going to live a selfless life? Start off by denying ourselves and saying, Jesus, we want what you want. I'm not trying to get you on my page. I'm trying to get on your page. I want what you want. We want to follow your will. So today we're going to talk about being bold in, in our witness. And let me give you the context for what we're going to talk about in the scripture today. If, if you can imagine, there were some disciples that Jesus had been training and investing in for about three years and he's teaching him what it really means to know God. And he's teaching them how to know God's will. He's investing in them. And the whole time Jesus is explaining to them, every now and then he'll say something like this. Now, you guys need to remember the whole reason that I'm doing this is because one day I'm going to give my life. I want you to not forget this. One day, I'm going to have to lay my life down, and I'm going to have to die. And then on the third day, God's going to raise me from the dead. The disciples had an incredible difficult time with this because they didn't really understand the context like we do today. See, we're looking back at the picture. They didn't, they didn't have that luxury. And so it's like they were like, no, no, Jesus, you can't do this. And Jesus said, no. Guys, this is why I came. I'm going to have to die for the forgiveness of the sins of this world. This is my whole purpose. I didn't come for the healthy. I came for the sick. I didn't come for the righteous. I came for the sinners. I'm going to have to die, and God, but God is going to raise me back up three days later. I'm going to come back. I'm not just going to die and stay in the grave. I'm going to get back up, and the sign of me getting back up is to let you know that you can get back up as well. I want to let you know that. And so Jesus went to the cross and he suffered brutally. And three days later, it's, it's Sunday evening. And, 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 and what do you think the disciples are doing? Do you think that they're out preaching boldly? He's coming back. Don't worry. He told us this was what's going to happen. We've been waiting on this day. Woo! We are excited. We, we are fired up. All 12 of us could not be more excited about this day any minute. Any minute. Here he comes. He's coming. Just wait for it. Not at all. In fact, John's gospel tells us this is what they were doing in John 20, verse 19. The Sunday evening that the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of Jewish leaders. I'm going to read that again. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of Jewish leaders. Jesus said, I'm going to come back. But what were they were doing? They were cowering in fear behind locked doors. Why? Because they were afraid of those who were enemies of Christ. Why is it that those of us that are Christians, why aren't we more bold in our witness 
And I think it's, there's a lot of reasons. I'm going to give you a few. One reason is I think, it, we, I mean, I just don't know enough. I don't know enough to be effective. Listen, if you've been broke, busted, disgusted, and you've been redeemed and you've been saved, you already know enough. Well, I don't know this scripture and that scripture. Just, hey, you don't got to know all the scripture for somebody to see a changed life. Your changed life will do more than you can tell in the scripture. And then as you get in the scriptures, you can tell what's going on now. But if your life has been changed by Jesus in any shape, form, or fashion, you are already equipped to think the testimony to let everybody know what God did for me, he can do for you. That's it. And you're like, well, Pastor Todd, they told me at my last church I need to do this, this, and this. I'm telling you, last church lied. You don't got to do all that. You got to be saved. How many times did people, Jesus changed their life, and he said, don't go tell nobody about it, and they went and told everybody. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus is telling them to go tell everybody, and they told nobody. In the Old Testament, they didn't even have the power of the Holy Spirit. And God's healing people. And they don't tell them. They go tell everybody. In the New Testament, Jesus says, don't say a word. About, hey, you got to go meet this man. This man over here is doing this and doing this. and do- he, did that. he opened this blind guy, and then this guy got off this mat, and he just walked. He never walked before. And then the next thing you know, he's just lumping and jeeping and blah, and you ought to go see it. Hey, look, look, if all you can do is this, you got a testimony. Uh, you're not ready for me. I can see y'all not ready for me. You say, well, he didn't heal me from, from, from doing this and this. No, he did something better. He keeps you from going to hell. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? He gives us what we don't, what we deserve, but he gives us mercy. Somebody give God a good shout of praise for mercy this morning. Uh, we don't know enough, so if we start sharing our faith in Christ and somebody asks us a question, we're like, um, I don't know what to tell you. And another reason is we don't want to offend nobody. I'm going to step on some toes. This world don't care nothing about offending me. Every show I watch now, it's got to have at least two or three homosexual couples on it. Everybody's living together and shacking up. No one's coming to the church asking, hey, what do y'all think? How does this view among your members? Did your members like this episode this last week? No one asked me. They just keep doing it. Why are we so worried about offending people when we're the ones that really have the truth? Oh, I know I offended someone. I know somebody's going to get mad. I'm mad here. You should have never said that. Just keep coming. You're going to get madder. I promise you. That's the least of the Lord I can do to make you mad. I promise you that. We don't want to offend them. We don't want to be pushy. We don't want to be that. I don't want to be that kind of Christian. I don't want to be that guy. Maybe somebody needs you to be that guy. In my opinion, if, if you get to the root of it, almost every excuse we have, the root of it is because we're afraid. We're afraid we don't know enough. We're afraid we'll look silly. We're afraid we won't get it right. We're afraid, and we're locked behind doors, afraid of the Jewish leaders. It sounds just like these disciples, and I totally get it. Why is it that we're not bolder in spirit? Most of us, because we're afraid, but, but I want to show you one additional verse of Scripture, one event, one moment that transformed these disciples from being timid and being afraid to being bold and being courageous. One event, one moment. Look at verse 19. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, somebody say Suddenly. Suddenly, Jesus, the man who had died three days earlier, the man that was put in a tomb, Jesus was standing there among them, and I love what he said to him. He said, peace be with you, because that's not normal to see dead people just get up and start walking. <laughs> Look, I know he said he was coming, but I'm going to be honest with you. I know we got some saints of God, and y'all pray in tongues, and you pay your tithes. And you ought to, if a dead man comes walking up in my house, I'm going to be like, It's not normal. So Jesus has to tell them because he knows that like, even though he told them, they're not prepared for it. God ever told you something you weren't prepared for? Like go plant a church. 1997, Todd, go plant a church. Uh, you didn't even say peace be with you. <laughs> uh, and all of a sudden, These guys went from being selfish, being timid, being afraid, 
being self-centered to being bold and courageous and evangelistic in everything that they did. These guys who are in one moment hiding behind locked doors, the next moment they're out preaching boldly. Peter, the biggest coward of them all. You say, why? He caved in to a teenage girl. A teenage girl had Peter backing up, and he said, I don't know who Jesus is. And they said, who's this? I don't know him. I'm not with him. I never met him. And now he's out preaching in front of all these people, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sin. You see, you couldn't shut Peter up, and the religious leaders arrested him. They put him in jail, and they're still preaching, and they're preaching in the prisons. And then this high priest, this guy named um, (laughs) Anus, And I just got to pause for a moment and think about this guy's name. I know he's a high priest, but you know everybody behind closed doors are like, there comes Anus. <laughs> Look, I'm just reading the Bible. I'm just, everybody going, he, he offended me. I'm just reading the Bible. Sometimes it's the funny names in the Bible. Like, don't name your kid Anus. I'm just, and then in the Old Testament, one guy names his, Daughter Gomer. Don't don't name your daughter Gomer. <laughs> she better be a looker. <laughs> oh, let me go on. And so <laughs> so so Anus the high priest says, You healed this guy. By what power did you heal him? And in Acts chapter four, here's what we see Peter, the guy hiding. The guy that just got through denying Christ in Acts chapter 4, verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you, to all the people of Israel, watch his boldness, that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, the man you crucified, but God has raised him from the dead. That's how he got healed. What was he doing? Because there was an empty tomb. Listen, he's got boldness now. Why? Because there's an empty tomb. Because Christ was risen. Because he defeated death, hell, and the grave. The very man that was timid in spirit is now bold and courageous because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And everybody in this room ought to have that same kind of fire on the inside of you. If a bloodstained cross and an empty tomb don't move you, nothing is ever going to move you. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? Our God is not dead. He's still alive. Somebody say amen. Amen. That's enough to get up and do what you need to do. So what do we learn from this? We, We need to embrace the principle. If you're taking notes, and that is this, we speak boldly about what we believe deeply. You speak boldly about what you believe deeply. We all do this. Because Peter experienced the resurrection of Christ, it consumed him. And later on, he he can't stop talking about it. It's everything to him. We all speak boldly about what we believe deeply. Let me prove it to you. If, if, If you go to a great restaurant, and it's amazing, what do you do? You tell everybody. You tell everybody, hey, look here. Over at Texas Roadhouse, they got these rolls to make you get filled with the Holy Ghost. And, and if you don't believe me, in order to loosen your tongue, put some honey butter on that bowl. Ah! Put that honey butter on there. I, I should have got some free gift cards from Texas Roadhouse the other day. I talked about Texas Roadhouse. About 30 people from, from TWC tagging at Texas Roadhouse. They over there eating. Mexicans didn't send me nothing. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I need to quit hanging out with Mike and Gail. I probably shouldn't say that. I'll tell you. The whole time we're on the golf course, Mike Rangel, all the things, he said, this mess can hear, this mess can hear. And so I think as a white person, I'm not allowed to say that. But, you know, <laughs> if your church is like 68% Hispanic, this mess can hear didn't even send me no. Uh, <laughs> listen, you go to a good movie, what do you do? I just saw a great movie yesterday, The Underdog, American Underdog, whatever, the, the, the Kurt Warner movie. Great movie, man. I encourage everybody to go see Kurt Warner movie. It's an amazing movie. If I get a group pair of shoes, I want everybody, like right now I'm hooked on the on clouds. 
I like me some on clouds. If you don't got no on clouds, everybody need to get some on clouds. I'm digging the on cloud. We went to New York. We walked 35 miles. I'm the only one that has some on cloud boots. And by the day three, everybody was over there buying them some on cloud shoes because everybody's feet was hurting. This fat boy was just like, <laughs> I wasn't hurting at all. I said, you see, you spend a little money. Quit being so cheap. Go get you some good shoes. I'm just telling you, everybody, about three of them went and bought them some on clouds. Oh, Pastor Todd, we should listen to you. you listen. I said, you're going to let me get you to heaven? You won't even let me get you to a shoe store? <laughs> you better ask somebody. But you tell everybody about it, man. And, and we, wh- why? Because we speak boldly about what we believe deeply. And if we're not speaking boldly about our faith in Jesus, do we really believe it deeply? That's a great question to ask yourself. Watching online, that's a great question to ask yourself. If we're not talking about Jesus, do we really believe in it? Verse 12 of of Acts 4, he says, there is salvation in no one else. God, you better say amen right there. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. The members of this council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see they were ordinary people, come on, ordinary people with no special training in Scripture. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. They were amazed by their boldness. Here's the question for those of you that consider yourself Christians. How amazed are the people around you about your boldness for Christ? If you call yourself a Christian, how amazed are people? And, and, and let's kind of quantify this a little bit. On a scale of one to 10, one is unmoved. 10 is people are massively amazed. How amazed are they? Now, nobody in here better put 10. Jesus is a 10. Right. You ain't Jesus and neither am I. Right. Don't be about, I'm a 10. No, you're not. No, you're not. You're not. I know you think you're the best thing since white bread, but you're not a 10. You might be like nine and a half like me, you know. <laughs> well, that's the hatefulest bunch of people I ever preached to in my life right now. Y'all be laughing when you ain't supposed to be laughing. But, 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 but for those of you that say, man, I'm like a seven or eight, let me know how. I'm, I'm going to tell you how you can define if you're a seven and an eight. And this may offend some of you, but check this out. If you're a seven or eight, you probably got one or two people that you brought to, with church to with you this morning. You got people that you brought from your school or your gym or from the place that you work with because you're always inviting people to just come try your church. Just come try your church, man. Just come see Jesus. Or, or perhaps at least this week you talked to two or three or four different people about your faith, that how God was using you. And, and once you got your list of people every morning, I mean, you're praying for your neighbor and you're praying for their, their dog. And you're not praying for their cat, though, but you're praying for their dog. And, and, and you're praying for the people that they work with. And you've got names that you call out loud every single day. And you got a heart to share the good news with other people. Did it just get cold in here to y'all? Me too. Somebody go tell somebody it's cold. Pastor Kevin, will you go tell somebody it's cold? Somebody with a thermometer? <laughs> Jesus. You know, when I'm cold, that's cold, boy. I'll tell you that right. Fat boy gets cold. That's bad. But you got a heart to share the good news. If, if, if that's you and you're constantly, there it went off. Pray, thank you. See, the Lord heard the cries of my heart. Bless God. <laughs> and you're constantly inviting people to church, you're probably like a seven or an eight. Well, how do you know if you're lower on the scale? Well, it's probably pretty obviously. You probably never brought anybody to church at all. And if you pray, you may hit it every other day or every three days or every four days. You don't share your faith at work. You're not even sure the people at your work even know that you're a Christian. You're probably lower on the scale of how amazed people are by your boldness. What would it be for you? How amazed are people by your spiritual boldness. And I want to say this to you. By this time next year, that needle should move. That needle should be moving. If it's not moving, then you're stagnant. If you know what happens with dirty water, it starts to stink. When it starts to stand too long, it just starts to stink. If you're a follower of Jesus, we are called to go into the world. We're called to be salt and light. And this calling is just isn't a suggestion. I want to say it again. It's not a suggestion. It's a calling. Amen? Yeah. Let me give you two thoughts. I'm going to get out of your way how to get bold. Number one, simply spend more time with Jesus. 
Well, Pastor Todd, it's got to be more complicated than that. No, that's the problem with the church today. We try to complicate it. It's not complicated. Spend more time with Jesus. And that means we're praying. We're listening to him. We're in communication. We're reading his word. We're spending time. For example, look at verse 13 of Acts 4. They were amazed by the disciples' boldness, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in Scripture. One version says they were ordinary, unschooled men. There's a Greek word translated as unschooled, and that word is idiotas. Guess what that English word is? Idiots. It's the word idiots. If you've, I got some good news for some of us this morning. You ready? If you have ever felt like an idiot, I want you to understand you're the perfect candidate for God to use. If you're here this morning, you're like, I just feel like an idiot. Good, then God can use you. Somebody's, praise the Lord. I didn't think I was good for anything. (laughs) God specializes using idiots who have been with Jesus. Listen, they also recognized them as men. Watch this. They recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. What happens when we're followers of Christ, but we don't spend time with Jesus? Let me tell you what happens. I don't have time, if I don't have any time with him in the morning, any time with him in the day, instead of being heavenly minded, I get no earthly good. I get consumed with everything in this world like everybody else does. Somebody cuts me off in traffic, I don't want to shoot them the finger. I want to run them off the road. I want to rear end them. Because I'm 51. My insurance isn't that high anymore. And so, <clears throat> but I get angry. I get consumed with the things of this world. Remember that lady in fried green tomato, tomatoes? Tawanda! Anyway, so, and, and I get in the way. <laughs> See what goes through my head? I, I, I get way too into social media. I get way into what people think of me more than I should care about it. And then the next day, because I didn't have anything happen spiritual, I don't want to spend time with God because I skipped the day before. And now I'm dry, and all these negative spiritual consequences flow out of that. On the other hand, if I do almost every day of my life, this is what I do. I wake up, I spend the first hour, or half hour, 45 minutes with God, reading my YouVersion Bible app, letting God's word renew my mind, adjust my attitude away from selfishness, away from my selfish mindset. And I begin to pray. I ask God to bring people before God in situations. And I say, Lord, lift up this family, and lift up this family, and what? they're going through. And I've got divine confidence. When I walk out of the house, God is with me. His spirit is guiding me. Suddenly I feel bolder. Why? Because I started my day out with him. I didn't let my day get a hold of me. I got a hold of my day. And and, and so when I see an opportunity, I recognize that this is someone that God brought before me in my life to make a difference in their life. And so I might say something to them. I might give them something. I might do something to serve them and, and, and see how God might use it. And it increases my faith and I become even more bold. And so I do it again and again and again. And the next day when I wake up, I wanna spend more time with Jesus because I've got spiritual positive momentum going on in my life because I started the day before with it. If you want to grow in boldness, it's very simple. Spend time with Jesus. They were amazed at the boldness and they took note. They were ordinary, everyday people. The only difference was is they had been in the presence of God. Here's the second thing you can do. Ask God to make you bold. Now, I've already preached this one time this year, but here it is again. Ask God to make us bold. When was the last time you asked God for boldness? You ask him and watch, he'll answer that prayer. The religious leaders continued to threaten the disciples. They said, we're going to put you in jail. Imagine if you could not only possibly go to jail for sharing your faith, but you could possibly lose your life. In some countries around the world, there's a reality that people get killed just for mentioning the name of Jesus. But listen, we live right here in the land of the free where we can do whatever we want to do and say whatever we want to say and worship how we want to worship, and we still don't do anything. Anything. Yeah, so and people in other countries are willing to risk their life. When you go bold for your faith in Christ in some countries, based on wherever you were raised, your family might even turn on you or your life can be in danger. What if that was happening to us? What would we pray for? Would we pray, oh God, keep me safe today. God, if I share, keep me safe. Pray me, 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 me. Watch the disciples under the potential of life and death. Here's what they prayed for in verse 29. And now, oh Lord, hear their threats and give us your servants great boldness in preaching your word. Not keep me safe, make me bold. 
Make me bold. Not protect us, but give us boldness. Even though they're already threatening us, God, make us even more bold in what you've called us to do. When we spend time with Jesus, I guarantee you, you will grow in your boldness for the God. You will grow in it. Amen? When this life is over, people are going to spend somewhere forever in eternity. And they're either going to spend that in the presence of God in heaven or in the horror of eternal hell and damnation. And I know there's people watching online and maybe even some of you here this morning, you're like, Pastor Todd, I don't want to hear that. That kind of preaching makes me uncomfortable. Listen, I cannot be true to the scripture without telling you there is a very real place the Bible calls hell. You hoping and wishing is not going to change it. It's called eternal damnation. It's called a place of torment. It's called the outer darkness. It's called the place of sorrow. There's indescribable suffering that happens day and night eternally in a place called hell. And words cannot convey the horror or the excruciation or the anguish of hell. In another way, in the same way, there's another place and words cannot adequately convey the glory, the beauty, the splendor, the majesty of the dwelling place of God and his people in what Bible calls the heaven. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. I don't know why you wouldn't want to go to heaven. I don't know why. We can't even dream it up, Paul said. We can't even explain it. It's so wonderful. John, one of the guys who was preaching in our text, had a vision, and this is what he said as I get ready to close in Revelation 21. He said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will wipe away every tear from their eye. And there will be no more death. Come on, somebody. There will be no more sorrow. There will be no more crying. There will be no more pain. And all these things are gone forever and ever and ever. And the one sitting on the throne said, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all the blessings. And I will be their God. And they they will be my children. Come on, man. That's such great news. We speak boldly about what we believe deeply. A timid, fearful faith doesn't reach the lost heart and broken world. What I want you to understand is that there are people in your life that you love who do not know the grace of Jesus. And at this moment, it's not too late for them, but one day it's going to be too late. You can't decide when you're six foot under. Pastor, I I, I just don't want to think about that. Not thinking about it is not helping you. I'll do it tomorrow. No, if you won't do it today, you won't do it tomorrow. How many of us have already lied to ourselves? And we were joking, but we already lied to ourselves. I'm going to lose that. January 1, I'm going on a diet. We already put it off till Monday. We can't even trust ourselves to a diet plan. Are you still here? So people say, well, what if I do this and I don't get it right? And what if I try and they tell me no, pastor? And what if, what if fear, 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 fear? And what if I share my, ma- my faith and they don't want to hear it? Can, can I just give you another question to ponder maybe that's even greater than that one? What if I don't? What if I don't share my faith and they go to hell? What if I don't butcher my way through it? And, and, and maybe I don't have the right words. And maybe, maybe it's not high priest anus. Maybe you say it another word. Maybe that, may, Michael, maybe I pronounced that whole word wrong. I'm not so worried about my pronunciation as I am getting a message across. At the end of the day, you can't expect a whole lot. I grew up on the east side of Lubbock. Come on, somebody. I didn't go to no cemetery. I mean, seminary, my bad. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't go to one of those places. In one moment, they were scared to death. But when they realized Jesus was risen, listen, when they realized he was risen, it changed everything. Have you realized that Jesus is alive forevermore? 
And is he alive in your heart this morning? Because the tomb is empty and instead of being afraid, we are to be like Peter, an ordinary person filled with the Holy Spirit. Be courageous, be bold. And we believe Jesus is the name above every name. We believe Jesus is the soon returning, conquering king and the Lord of lords, the truth, the light, the way. When you believe that, it ought to change the way you live and the way you execute, the way you talk to people. Well, I don't want to offend them. I would rather you be offended me on earth than hate me in hell. I get asked, I'm, I'm, listen, I've been doing this for 30 years. People ask me questions all the time. I, I don't know the answer. And you know what I say? Okay, I don't, Ronnie asks me questions sometimes. I'll be like, I don't know, Ronnie. But I make up stuff for Ronnie because he don't know I'm making it up. <laughs> I, I, I'll be honest with you, and I, I'm honest with you. Buddy, I don't know. If you give me a couple of days, I'll look into it. Nobody's ever asked me that. I've never thought of it that way. Well, you're the pastor of the church. You ought to know. No, no, as believers, we ought to know as much as we can know. No matter if you're a pastor or not a pastor, we're all, we all got the same responsibility. Oh, it got quiet then, didn't it? We all got this. Long before I was pastor, I was just called believer. And that's what I'm most concerned about is taking as many people with heaven as I can possibly take with me. You remember when you were living for the world, because when I was living for the world, I remember making these phone calls and calling my buddies and saying, hey, man, I'm going to the club tonight. Y'all want to go? And they're like, we ain't got no money. What's the first thing out of my mouth? I got you. I got you. Don't even worry about it. I got you. I'd have an eight ball. And, hey, man, I'm going to get high. Y'all want to get high? No, we ain't got no coke, but I got an eight ball. I got you. But you're going to have to put a little bit on it. You want to smoke some weed? I got a bag. I got a good bag. I got a good dime bag. Man, you want to get on? I ain't got no money. I got you. Why is it when we get to church, we forget to get them? We were buying drinks. We were buying weed. We were. And when we get to church and we forget about it. I would go spend four, five, six hundred dollars at a bar in a night. And then we go to church and they take up the offer and they say, give 10%. And everybody goes, <laughs> like your bowels are going to run on you. <laughs> but when we were out in the world, we didn't care about it. It's amazing to me that 10% is so much at church, but not much at a sale. I, I'm, I'm just saying we... I think we got our principles messed up in a lot of ways, guys. I just think we forget where we come from. I, I promise you, if I had the cure for cancer, I would not be preaching here today. I would be at MD Anderson trying to tell every cancer doctor, look, the Lord showed me how to clear cancer, and this is how you fix it, okay? But I don't have the cure for cancer, but what I do have the cure is for sin, and that's why I'm here today trying to tell as many people that listen, listen, if you'll do this, this, and this, man, God... God's going to redeem it. God's going to make it so much better on this side. It's so much better on this side. And my mama hates it when I say this, but I, I, I say it. My mom really hates it when I, I'm smoking what I'm selling. I'm smoking what I'm selling, man. I, I got off on this Jesus train in 30 years. I cannot tell you how many times I went to an altar and got up and left unchanged until I, I saw Jesus for myself. I quit listening to everybody else, and I met Jesus for myself, and it changed everything. When you have an encounter for yourself and quit depending upon your mama, your daddy, your pastor, and your grandmama, it'll change everything you want to know about God, I promise you. You can taste and see that he's good, amen? Someone ever head bowed this morning? And you're here today, and, and man, you realize on that scale of one to 10, your boldness is not where it should be, or, or maybe your boldness isn't there because you don't have a relationship with him, or maybe you did, and for whatever reason, it's kind of gone downhill. I'm not so interested in what caused you to go downhill or how you got there as much as I am helping you get it fixed and getting on the right track. But you'll just raise your hand. You'll say, Pastor Todd, that's me. I need some help this morning. That's you. Go ahead. There, oh, there you go. Yeah. Amen. Hey, don't be ashamed to raise your hand. That's why we come to church. Yeah. Who else? Man, I need some help, Todd. We're not going to throw any rocks at you. We want to help you. Yes, sir. I see you right there. Once you raise it, you can put it down. Anyone else? Yes, sir, I got you. Please don't miss this. Please don't miss. Yes, I got you. Yes, ma'am. Please don't go in this year like you came out of last year. 
Let's make that needle turn this morning. Let's move the needle on that bar where we can leave this house and say that God is good for me. If you raised your hand, I wonder if you'll take another step of faith and you'll come and let us pray with you this morning.